All right, everybody. I'm so excited to uh, bring this woman back to the podcast. It's been a minute since we talked about a Survivor season, but I'm uh, so happy for this homecoming to welcome back to talk Survivor 44, the great Kellen Bechtel. Kellen, how are you? Woo! Hey, yo, Robbio. Yes. How's it going? It's been a while. It's been a minute. And I'm so excited to get to talk to you. And I know uh, we had been uh, chatting and I know that you were following uh, this season. So I thought it would be a great time to have you back to talk about everything that's going on. And I've got uh, so many uh, questions for you. But uh, what have you been up to, Kellen? Like in, in life other than watching Survivor? Other than watching Survivor, because we will spend, you know, 99% <laughs> of this podcast talking about Survivor. Other than watching Survivor and Australian Survivor, which then takes I went, I'm going to ask you about right? that also, but at the end, at the at end. At the I'm end, not gonna... don't worry, folks, we'll save that. Yes. Um, so I have been splitting and living my time. I got married again, for those of you who, who didn't know. Mm -hmm. um, and I split to spend half of my time in Spain, half of my time in Northeast Indiana. So if there are any survivor fans around here you know hit me up you're on gonna Twitter, have a meetup a north a manchester meetup I, there might be one other person who comes um but i've been here i've been working for myself since may of last year which has been really fun being my own boss is mm -hmm. a lovely way to live i'm doing coaching so you know blah 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 life coaching yeah. but actually it's really really fun so is that the specific type of coaching that you that you're doing? Because I feel like I see so much like uh, like when I watch your stuff, I feel like you're often talking about like specifically like business. Yeah. So I started out doing all career coaching, um, which is why many people come to work with me, whether they want to have a job change or they're asking for a promotion, negotiating their salary, not mm -hmm. getting along with their boss, these kinds of things. But now like 85% of my clients have made it through that initial job change and we're still working on a month to month basis. So to be honest, it's, it's up in the air on the, the branding side of it. But what is genuine and real is the conversations I'm having with my clients and just helping them work through life changes. You know, yes. it's, it's, we don't always have to stay on the same path if we don't want to. So, okay. All right. Well, I think that that's probably gonna be very relevant to the discussions we're going to have about these uh, survivor players and sort of like the uh, team dynamics at play here mm -hmm. in survivor 44. But you know, I'm so excited to have you, uh, one, back here on the podcast. But number two, that I am really excited to talk to somebody from Ghost Island specifically, <laughs> because I really feel like, you know, and, and I've been doing, a, you know, a lot of videos of going back and like trying to like go into like survivor history and sort of like uh, look at like, you know, how do we get here? Like where mm. and in the research that I did last week, I did a video all about fake hidden immunity idols. Mm. And I really felt like that looking back, I really feel like that ghost Island sort of soft launched the new era. Yes. Mm. After four, survivor 41 is officially the new era, but I really think like going back and looking at survivor history, ghost Island, I feel like was a season that got us like on the trajectory that we are on now. Mm, that's interesting. Uh, you mean from the production standpoint and just from our cast, especially Dom, bringing up this idea of passing around fake idols, you mean? So much so. Uh, so I feel like that both from uh, production and also from, you know, the, you, the your cast and, and uh, just like the gameplay and sort of like the lessons and sort of like even like the way that the show was presented – I do feel like that Ghost Island changed a lot of things. Let me let me give you a little bit of my thinking on this. Now, first off, you know, Ghost Island in, in regards to the fake hidden immunity idols, which is how like I ultimately like stumbled into this discovery. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Jacob Derwin's making fake immunity idols. Dama Bate is making fake immunity idols and putting the real note with the fake immunity idol, which to my knowledge is the first time that that happens. Um, even David Wright's fake immunity idol from Survivor 33 comes back in Survivor 36. Now, you all had just seen a Survivor in, when you went to go play it, correct? That that was one of the last seasons you had seen yes. uh, before you went out there. So it took a while for it to catch up. Like the Game Changers, for instance, other than Zeke, 
had uh, and Michaela had not seen season 33. So they didn't see the scene where David Wright makes the fake idol. So it must have been top of mind for people on your season. Certainly. Yeah, I, certainly. That It's crazy. Man, doesn't that make us feel old? It makes me mm-hmm. feel a little old, first and foremost. It feels like we're talking about history past of Survivor, but here we are. Um, yes, it was at the beginning of this idea around, is someone planting something else for us to find? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's funny to look, oh, bless Dom. I know he loves that idol, but damn, does that not look like an idol at all? Like nothing about his <laughs> No, it was shell. it was disgusting. <laughs> it was like a seashell with a hole through it. Um, but, okay, but that's not even where I want to go with this. Okay, okay, okay. All right. But also that I do believe then Ghost Island does also become sort of the uh, prototype ultimately for what ultimately becomes Shipwheel Island and going on the trek and that you're going to go, you're going to go on a journey. You're going to go to a place and you're going to have a decision and you're going to risk your vote. Ghost Island is the first time that that mechanic is really introduced into the game of you get, you get to have the opportunity to risk your vote to win a thing. Uh, Will you, will you ultimately risk it uh, to get some sort of advantage in the game? We hadn't seen that before. You were the first person to say, you know what? I am not going to risk my vote to no, get the advantage. No, thanks. Uh, my life is fine. <laughs> yeah, I'm good here. I'm, I know what's going on. I know what would make good TV if I didn't have that vote. If I didn't mm-hmm. have a vote, not quite as exciting. And then what do they do with that? They're like, lady, not, not, not. Yes. <laughs> now the people, I'm sorry to the 44 people, production says people like Kellen are going to go out there and say, no, thank you. And now they don't even have the option. Well, which... they, they don't have the option, but also Kellen, like I also feel like that another thing from Ghost Island is that the show also is going to, you know, not on the island, but to the viewers, a little bit browbeat the contestants who are going to have more passive gameplay, you know? It's like, why, uh, why Why? didn't you play the game? Why didn't you make a move? Even Dom going to the end, that Dom gets the browbeat of, why didn't you put yourself into the fire making against Wendell? It's the season that really becomes, I, I feel like synonymous with, hey, we are going to now condemn anybody that doesn't make the riskiest move possible. <coughs> Did that just start with our, our season? It certainly feels like it It got um, burned into us like a Yellowstone brand of like ha- shame on you for not making the big move. Um, and then, but isn't that the actual interesting part of when someone goes off to Ghost Island or up to the ship wheel place is to be sitting in your seat and saying, what would I have done? Isn't that the essence of being a Survivor it fan? Is, is but, what would I have done in that yeah. moment? Well, but if the, you actually have a choice, uh, but you <laughs> you do not at, at this point in time. Um, and then the, uh, the one other thing about Ghost Island, this was the one that is pertains specifically to you, Callan, because I also think that you are an important figure in Survivor history, because I also feel like that you are the first contestant, at least the first contestant that I could think of where the show's producers really did try to tie a player's backstory and their reason for coming on to Survivor as some sort of window into how this person was going to play Survivor. And Mm -hmm. I think that really you were one of the first people to get like a backstory of like you were coming into Survivor, you had been through a divorce, you were coming in and you were looking to, you know, uh, you were going to like, basically this was an opportunity for you to, you know, uh, you know, go with your gut and do things, you know, like uh, you weren't going to play by the rules per se anymore. And I don't really remember a lot of other survivor players prior to you having that type of like fleshed out backstory that was informative of how that person was approaching the game it's interesting that you haven't seen that 
with other people. I, cause I feel like I'm always watching what, where someone is in their life and what they're doing, but you're right. It was certainly my confessionals were about my life and about what I was doing, not just in that ghost Island. Like all of us who went to ghost Island got a little profile of, you know, Chris Mm -hmm. talked about his mom. Jenna talked about her resting bitch face. I think something dramatic like that. No. Um, Yeah. And and it's interesting. You bring back the ghost because ghost Island was also a vehicle in which that a player goes to ghost Island. And now we can really like, you know, have them, talk about themselves in ways that I don't really feel like that we saw contestants talking to camera about themselves and their journey and their backstory prior to that point. And this week we didn't even get to see them talk to each other at all. So (laughs) we, there was literally no point. Like Mm -hmm. the survivor could have just, the producers could have flashed up on the screen two seconds the the these three people went they switched tribes and this is where they are done that in three seconds because not there was no point to watching mm-hmm. what we what we saw on Super Island yeah but to, I mean if you're asking me to think about what that experience was like I mean of going through watching the show back and seeing my personal story tied in with how I played the game and it did t- it is the truth it is in those moments, I think the producers probably wanted me to be riskier, to go with my new gut instinct and play in this outward way and take control. Ultimately, I didn't. Ultimately, it cost me a million dollars. Like mm-hmm. I would say earlier on in the game than what I could see maybe when we were talking about the season. So that thought of producers using someone's personal story to drive the narrative of how they play, I think works if it's true. And for me, it was true. I was in it. Like I was in yeah. it. If they forced that on someone else, I think for the viewer, I mean, some people didn't like watching me on that journey anyway, but I think it was a fake, if it was a fake one, it really wouldn't work yeah. from a viewership standpoint. And Kel, I hope it's not coming across as if I'm saying like the, the, the producers were doing anything like manipulative or no. like manipulating you in any sort of way. I just think that like from a historical perspective, I really do think that you were sort of the prototype for the person that Survivor is going to do their storytelling through sort of like a extensive backstory that informs the viewers of how this contestant is approaching the game. Yeah, and I think that's a casting thing too, right? Finding the people who understand where they are in their life enough to understand how it parallels with the way they're playing Mm -hmm. Survivor. Because you're right, producers did not in any way, shape or form, tell me that I should continue to think about whether or not I am working with Dom and Wendell as my ex-husband. But in a way, as you're out there, you're like, am I going to let these guys just roll over me? Like I just spent my whole life letting these loud men in work, in my personal life, tell me what to do. Like, I'm not going to let them do that to me. Um, So I was going through that in my own speech and in my own confessionals, my own therapy on a day-to-day basis going on the confessionals. Um, I'm not sure everyone wants to be that vulnerable on national TV, but you know, it's made me Mm -hmm. who I am today. I'm thankful for that. I do like the idea inherently of understanding why people are making the decisions they are making in the middle of the game because of who they are and where they've been. That is interesting to me. Um, I don't know that that's something in old school survivor that we got that often. Like it would be like a character is playing and they're doing these things, but it's not, this is where they are on their life path yeah, and how they're playing the game. So I have, I'm, proud to be one of the first or the first and again this is just my thesis i'm sure somebody will write it and say actually they did for this person bah, 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 bah. but in, in my mind that you are the person who sort of sticks out in that way and i don't even think that it's necessarily like i'm not even saying that in any sort of like a bad thing i do wonder if we are executing on it as well as possible because of all of the other things that survivor is trying to do in 42 minutes. I think that that is like, uh, you know, there's just too much going on. So even though I agree, I think that that is an interesting thing to explore with the contestants of how their lives outside of the game has informed all of the decisions leading up to this point. And in the future of this game, I just feel like that uh, we're trying to cram, you know, hours and hours of stuff into 42 minutes and it becomes a little bit like that we're not hitting on 
any of our objectives. They're not hitting on any, I mean- Or not like, as many as we would like. No, and to think, I guess Jesse is the person that we got to see there a little bit last season into why he was playing the way he was just from his background and sure. the life he wanted to have for his children. I think, I think that's what they were, it seemed. Um, so it, maybe they can choose one person, but mm -hmm. I can't tell you who that is right now, unless it's Carolyn. I think it's going to be Carolyn. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. So, and let's, uh, talk about everything that went on with Carolyn uh, in this latest episode, because I, I think this was my favorite episode of the season so far, because it's the one that left me with the most to think about in terms of what Carolyn did and the decision that she made. How did you feel about how Carolyn approached this vote ultimately to go with Josh and vote out Sarah? Oh, well, I actually have my little questions for you. Please, please, <laughs> my question fire away. Card. And literally my question is, was this the right move for Carolyn? When I start to try to do all of the math out, it was actually extremely complicated. I don't know what you guys talked about last night. I haven't listened to any of the other okay, podcasts. Okay, good. Um, but she is seemingly sitting with all of the options, maybe more so than anyone else on that tribe at that time. Yeah. It, first of all, did she, my question that it helps me, I think put a border around all this conversation is, do you think that she told Josh to play it for himself and absolutely, not for her? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that she, think did. she did. Okay. And I believe next episode we will get a flashback to Carolyn saying, I was the one that told Josh to play his idol for me. I'm oh, sorry, for himself and not for me at last tribal council. In that sense, then why did she not let Sarah's vote be the, or let Josh's vote be the only one to send Sarah home? Um, I, that, that is certainly an option right. that she, she could have done. Uh, she, she could have done that. And there, there is some risk in that, you know, uh, that Josh could potentially then, you know, she could, she could play like, Hey, I, I'm with you. I'm telling you this thing, but I don't think that that's necessarily Carolyn's game, even though she has been able to be sort of like a double agent with these idols. I don't know. Uh, well, I guess, but maybe she was sneaky like that. I mean, she was, she did go through this whole thing. My whole thing, Kellen, is I can't tell if Carolyn is a bad actress or an amazing actress. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, and I've watched this multiple times. I don't know if Carolyn is lying or acting or reacting. I, I don't know. And this might be her greatest strength in that she cannot be read. I think that she is acting and reacting and the fact that we can't tell the difference because, and she's an amazing actress. When she, when Josh says he has an idol, she makes the face like she is shocked that he's mm -hmm. playing the idol, which I did watch this back three or four times to this moment to figure out what is it, what is it she's doing? And when he stands up and says, I have an idol, she is genuinely in her crazy way, like, like looking mm -hmm. back, like, wait, what he's doing, he's doing that. I think she is going in and out of acting and reacting and just stays like if, if everyone else is like acting and reacting here on an even playing field, she is just a level above or below, yeah. but a, le a different plane than everyone else. There is one question about all this that, if answered, would unlock a lot of this for me. And I, I will ask you this question, and maybe you have a good read mm -hmm. about the answer to this question. Was Josh going to actually play an idol for Carolyn at that tribal council? Yes, I think he was. I think he was, too. Uh, because... That people have, you know, said like that's preposterous. That he's not gonna, like uh, that. He has an idol. He why would he? Why would he play it? Why would he? Well, well oh, actually, there's so many, so many layers to this, Kellen. And I, I want to make sure I want to get the get this all out. I think that for Jam Jam and for Sarah, if they thought he had something, to think that he would go to that tribal council and not play it 
was a big miscalculation that he has if he has something he is definitely playing it and you were not going to trick him into not playing his thing that's that was the biggest miscalculation yes absolutely and i did listen to i didn't listen to no else but i did listen to sarah's exit yes. interview and and she said not to pick it apart but she did say right like we just were essentially banking on the fact that he wasn't going to play an idol yes i believe that josh wanted more so than this is my after watching this again i think that josh was playing jam jam and sarah the whole time and that and that he really wanted sarah to go out i believe Mm -hmm. that this was josh's decision hey i want sarah out of the game and i think that he thought the the way to do that was like i think he believed that maybe they might they might be serious of like hey i'm going to put the votes on carolyn and maybe he's like well i'm going to outplay them i'm going to play the idol on carolyn we'll put our two votes on sarah and sarah will be the person to go home like he might have th- i think that he might have thought they were really voting for he bought that they were voting for carolyn he bought that there was a feud but he didn't want to get rid of carolyn he wanted to get rid of sarah yeah i think I mean, I wish I could be the devil's advocate here and, and disagree with you, but I think when, and, and it helps weed back to your question of, does Carolyn know what's going, is she a master or a, a not, a, a master or not a master? Yes. Um, I think she is doing great that at coming along with Josh on his plan and using yes. it to what she believes is to her advantage to get Sarah out and to weaken Jam Jam. I think that is Mm -hmm. true. Even if she couldn't say that clearly, I think she did want him knocked down a peg. So Josh is going, is going to work to, you know, pull one over on Jam Jam and Sarah, but Carolyn is the one who actually has the most information. She knows that, no, that's not going to work. Now I got to tell you, like you got to play your idol on you. They're lying to you. And so, while she might not mind Sarah going home, I think she does want Josh to stay at that point. And so now she is, you know, tell has to tell Josh what what's going on. And she ultimately is now in this position where now she has to go through with this whole charade of. So it, I think that it was a it was a good. It, it, there were good moves from Carolyn. I, I, I went on the podcast last night and I, and I feel bad. I said, I thought this was a bad move for, for Carolyn. And I thought it was an erratic move for, for Carolyn. And in, in thinking about it more, say, I don't think it was bad, but I don't think it was optimal. In what way could she have? I feel like made it more optimal. Well, Kellen, tell me, tell me what you think about this. Okay. We saw that Carolyn and Jam Jam were, you know, having a little bit of a disagreement. We never heard it from Jam Jam. We did hear it from Carolyn. She didn't like being the decoy vote. She didn't like that Jam Jam is always telling her the plan. And she did not feel like equals with Jam Jam. Is that enough of a reason in your mind for her to go to these lengths to betray him or... Like you said, with people that you do coaching for, I'm having a disagreement with my boss. How do I handle that? And maybe this is me. Uh, Maybe I'm not cut out for the new era because in my mind, I think that the best path forward for Carolyn would be work this out with Jam Jam. Talk to Jam Jam and work this out. Even if that conversation is ultimately, dude, he has an idol. He, they're going to, Sarah is going home. Okay. Let's me and you, we're like, uh, we're, there's nothing we can do. We can't save her. Let's preserve what we have. And ultimately, you know, maybe J- Jam Jam sees her in a different light, maybe, but maybe Carolyn feels like I need to like, I, I need to like uh, abandon Jam Jam or teach him a lesson. Show him I can fend for myself. Yeah. See, that's what I'm, I, <laughs> that's what I'm worried about. This has made me question, and we should come back to it, but this has made me question in the vote, bef- in Helen's vote, if actually we thought Carson was 
choosing between Helen and Sarah and Jam Jam and Carolyn. And actually, I think Carson was working with Jam Jam and Carson was working with Carolyn. And those two seem to be... Say that one more time. So remember the Helen vote yes. that it seemed like Carson was either going to go with Jam Jam and Carolyn or with Helen and Sarah, mm -hmm. right? I think instead of Carson choosing between those groups of two, I think it was Carson with Carolyn separately, Carson with Jam Jam, and then Helen and Sarah were over here and Carson could have gone with that. So I think he was the central relationship. And maybe while we as audience members think that Jam Jam and Carolyn, because of their personalities, are having fun and getting along and being the two friends, I wonder if they haven't been getting on as well as we think. And thinking of them as a two was a mistake on our part. Mm -hmm. yeah. Which then makes so much more sense for Carolyn to say, why would I stay with jam jam when he doesn't listen to me he thinks he's better than me he quote unquote said to my face i'm not a threat maybe you could say great i will he, jam jam was v v very very bad in terms of uh how he handled that whole situation where you know he does a lot of like you know uh kidding not kidding everybody thinks i'm a threat and not you you know yes. he does He's not bombing have... socially, I think, on, on the island, sadly, because I love watching him on TV. But it's not going well for him with, with anybody, really. He he actually made more mistakes than Carolyn, the... no matter how this felt, felt out. Yes, I agree. Why put Carolyn, at, first of all, of all the people on that tribe, why Jam Jam and Sarah would choose Carolyn to be the decoy boat? That's like the match that's already on fire. Let's pour gasoline on it. Not mm -hmm. a great idea. Never use your least... Uh, controllable substance as the decoy. <laughs> that's a good rule. That's a good. I don't think that a lot of people talk about that. Of like, okay, and, and again, it makes sense. You why you would say that she was the decoy boat because it's like, well, that like they would buy that. You know, Carolyn seems like she's a little out there. Okay, like that. That is, you know, a, a reason that you would believe. Oh, she doesn't isn't getting along with us. She's too much of you know a hard person to uh you know keep with the group so yeah. that's why she's not fitting in that's why we have to vote her out like i do think that the cover story makes sense but you make a great point about that there's people that you can't say are the decoy kellen did you play with anybody that you felt that way of like okay we cannot let it be known that this person is the fake vote donathan donathan mm-hmm a thousand percent, Jonathan. Yep. I don't I, No one else comes to mind there. Um, I'm trying to think in pre-merge if there's anyone else who I wouldn't have let. James, probably. And that's in a different way, kind of. You know, James doesn't come across as, but he's certainly unsteady in a different way out there. So, yeah. How Jonathan. so? I, I feel like that he seems like the most steady. As long as he, as long as he, uh, is, He's pretty was pretty easy to lie to, but if he had gotten wind of anything, I think he would have immediately been willing to jump somewhere else, like a math guy. You know, mm -hmm. somebody's ultimately a math guy, no relationship uh, decision making going on. Like he's gonna change the numbers if he thinks he's not mm -hmm. on there, he's gonna change them. So I think those. Two, yeah. But Donovan, no question, certainly would not yeah. use him as a decoy. I want to also say that the other reason why I felt like that this was a bad decision for Carolyn was mm -hmm. that yes, she survives a she survives a vote. Um, but I, I and I guess people might be saying like, well, Rob, well, what do you think would have been the optimal move yes, for yes. her? So I think that she tells Jam Jam what's going on and being like, dude, like, uh, well, hold on, I guess I have to back up. The optimal move I think for Carolyn is. Josh plays his idol for Carolyn. She goes along with Josh's plan to play the idol on her that those guys are still able to, uh, you know, put, put the vote on to, uh, they put jam jam and, and Sarah put their two votes on Josh. Um, Josh plays the idol for Carolyn. If he does not, Carolyn stands up and plays her idol. You know, that's the ultimate. Mm. She has like the fail safe emergency yeah. break. She could also, and I'm going to, I'm talking and I'm not like writing this down with a, with my pen, 
Um, if she puts one vote on Sarah also, just in case Josh double cross, like, I, I, mean, I guess maybe part of her might have been afraid that are, are they actually going to double cross me? Do they think that he does have an idol and that he is going to play it on himself and that they are going to uh, that double cross to protect each other? Maybe that thought is going through her head. Uh, yeah. But but if he doesn't play the idol for her, she does have the and, and it's like, well, I don't want to waste my idol. But, you know, at some point, you know, we like the idols are pretty easy to come by these days. You know, <laughs> you gotta, you but, gotta... but wouldn't you say that we can almost be sure that she didn't think that she trusted that Jam Jam and Sarah were voting for Josh? She had to have trusted that. I think she she had to have because she didn't play her idol. So I think that right. she, did, she did believe that that was going to be the case. And the reason why I think that she should go through all of these lengths to stay with the people from Tika in Jam Jam and Sarah is because that it feels like, especially here in the new era, that you want to keep people, uh, as you once said, like uh, keep your Navidi strong of link back up with Carson after the merge and... Yeah, okay, she she might think like, okay, well, I, now I have Josh and Josh has all these people, but Josh might be on the outs uh, back with his original tribe. So she might be buying into uh, being uh, a partner of the weakest person from or the like weakest positioned person from his original tribe. She doesn't know. I, I feel like keeping the, the four Tikas in the game for as long as possible, I feel like that seems optimal especially because we must assume that she and Carson had a great relationship. I do not think that she voted with Carson because of Jam Jam at all. So yes, I agree with you that getting back to Carson with them, unless she has just been feeling left out anyway, and Carson was the only person who made her feel comfortable. And I think there's a chance that that mm -hmm. is the case. Um, so she might be feeling just on the edge no matter what. Mm-hmm. There's two, to, like, to kind of sum up my thoughts on this Carolyn thing is like, I really want to believe that she is a master gamer, as you said, and she does show signs of that. The other part of me can look at it and it is clearly an emotional, it was completely emotional. I think the last thing to do was to put two votes on Sarah in that moment, given what we know that she knew. Because she knew they were putting votes on Josh. She knew that Josh was playing his idol for himself, supposedly. Therefore, she didn't even need to throw that next vote on Sarah. That is the mistake. The same thing happens either way. Sarah still goes home either way, and she could have kept her relationship with Jam Jam. Yeah. Okay, Kellen, should Carolyn have played her shot in the dark last night? In the same way that Matthew used it to make his vote disappear, I guess that the downside, the reason not to do that is if Josh, for some reason, doesn't play his idol, I guess uh, it would not be a 2-2 tie. It would be a 2-1 vote, and Josh would just go home. But okay, no harm, no foul, right? Yeah. Um, Carolyn still has her idol, Mm -hmm. Um, she doesn't have to cat. She doesn't have to flip on jam jam. And she could say like, Hey, I had to play the shot in the dark. I was freaking out, man. Okay. Yes. Yeah, actually. Yes. A thousand percent. I hadn't thought that far in advance, but that is the way to go. Mm -hmm. You get yeah. off Scott free. She could have done the exact same thing though, and saved her shot in the dark and still thrown her vote on Josh. Yeah. And who knows? Maybe she hits it. <laughs> maybe she hits it. Maybe and it doesn't it. matter. It doesn't matter. Um, so yeah, that, it is that thick though. It is thick. Those that number of people at a tribal, and there's a new person. It there is a lot going on. There's a lot to think mm -hmm. through. There's a, a, a lot. You know, you wouldn't think with four people, but you guess you throw so many other th doodads in there. Idols, real idols, fake idols. Um, so a, a lot, uh, inheritance advantage, uh, a lot going on before we even think of, uh, about the shot in the dark. So, um, let me then also bring in moving forward because maybe this is like the, you know, uh, place where Carolyn, uh, you know, where things start to look, you know, that things went a certain way. We may not have liked how they, we got there. Okay. But now coming out of this tribal council. OK, um, Carolyn seemingly in a pretty good position at Tika with an idol 
with Jam Jam and Josh. And based off of what we see in the preview, it doesn't seem like they are getting along great. Now she does seem like she is in the driver's seat here, position in between the middle of Josh and Jam Jam. And while Jam Jam might be salty, what's he going to do? Where's he going? What's he going to do? Exactly. And to think that of all the things that Carolyn may or may not have been thinking about, one of them had to have been when it's down to three, what's going to happen to me? Mm -hmm. And her sitting with Sarah and Jam Jam seemed dangerous. I think she really felt that was scary. And she was mm -hmm. on the third. So good on her. But she has an idol. No matter how she got there, it seems like she really wants to hold on to the idol as well. I get it, but look, her. there's you more. Know, <laughs> these <laughs> idols. It's not like the old days, Kellen. If you have an idol and you think you might need it, play it. Just let go of it. But I think she feels good holding on to it and um, keeping it for further in the game, which is you know, the, that is the all the opposite of playing emotionally. That's why I like you cannot quite figure Carolyn out. It's the mix of seeming erratic so much so that when she was holding up the idol, when she opened up both idols, like I was like, oh my God, she doesn't even know which one is the right idol. And come to find out, she knew exactly which one was the right idol. It's just that the coin one is the fake one and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. um, and so even as the audience, we are tempted to believe that she doesn't know what the F is going on. And I hope she just slams right through all of us and everybody on the game and that she's been in control all along. That's what I hope for her. Yeah. And while I have been a little critical uh, or I, I've been very critical of uh, of the move, even though I still am working it out in my head of what I think about it. I do want to say I appreciate Carolyn so much as a as at, at, for right now, a character on the show already. She is an all time character on the show and one of like the greatest casting finds. And I think it remains to be seen. If we're talking about her potentially as a, a great, great player. It, yes, I, I agree. Although I would say if there's a scale, uh, zero is the shitty survivor player and 10 is a master survivor player. I think she's in, on the higher end. She's doing a lot of things that yeah. are, are really PBD. good survivor play. I think, I don't know if it's an accident. Um, I think she's a master player who can, just keeps getting pulled back into being emotional. Um, so it'll be fun to watch the rest of the time. I adore her. And one of the things about just Carolyn in general, my husband, Adrian, uh, shout out to him, a big Survivor fan now, had never seen shout the show out. or heard of Yo, it Adrian. before he met me. No. <laughs> um, he said, you know, I've been thinking about something. He said, I think to be a Survivor woman winner, you have to play... Uh, what did, I wrote it down. I said, wait, what did you say? Because I don't want to quote it wrong. He said, I think you're right. To be a woman survivor winner, you have to be a better winner than if you're a man. And he said, it seems like the only way you can get through is to be seen as a ditz. Just like how Carolyn is getting through right now. Hmm. And it's kind of leads us in a different, first of all, I love Carolyn. She comes across, here we are talking about, does she know what's going on completely? Does she not? And how much that has worked to her advantage over a Helen, over a Maddie, over the other women who have been seen as stable, intelligent women, um, that she's being a little bit perceived as less in control, makes her less of a threat. Um, and it seems to be working out for her right now, or at least at the beginning. And what does that say about being on Survivor as a intelligent woman who's in control? not great as we've seen so far in this season. Well, let's talk about the women on uh survivor and the plight that they have been through specifically here in the new era. I know uh, that you have been uh, following this uh, very closely as the survivor super fan. And you had a very uh, well written Twitter thread the other day about how, women specifically young women have uh not been doing as well on the show for reasons on uh the new era specifically it's about 43 and 44 I i'd love to hear uh your thoughts on that a little bit more 
Yeah, so I think I'll keep it small here in just the survivor way first and foremost. The reason why it would appear that young women are not doing well on Survivor in 43 and 44 is because there are three tribes of six. There is nowhere to hide. The challenges which you need to win to keep yourself from going to tribal involve lifting extremely heavy items. You can't tell on TV. I mean, maybe a moment when they were doing the slide puzzle, like those boxes had to have weighed hundreds of pounds. I mean, they are freaking heavy. Other challenges in the past, like the snake, they've shown people have posted that on Twitter. So there is a system in Survivor, a small group of people, there is nowhere to hide. The challenges are set up that you need to be tall, really, really physically strong to keep your tribe from going to tribal. That is point A. Simply put, it's easy, not hard to figure it out. You can't argue with it. The idea of there's different kinds of strength in Survivor is complete bullshit when you're talking about these huge tribe or huge challenges at the beginning of the game. I mean, I couldn't even, at the beginning of mine, there were 10 of us, like, oh, my, speaking of Adrian, he laughs at me all the time because I'm, like, always in the back, like, pretending like I'm helping Wendell lift something. Mm -hmm. Like, there's not something that a non-physical person like me can do. So I had watched to get ready to talk to you today. I was uh, looking at some of your uh, video going into Survivor. And it's something that you even talked about then of getting ready to uh, go into Ghost Island. That was something that you were uh, concerned about. of being And and how uh, you had gone to some measures to try to work, uh, you know, against that thought of like, okay, we're going to pick uh this person off because she's not contributing in the challenges even though you did win the first individual immunity challenge uh in your season which was a mistake um, but <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, not what we're here to talk about um, but can, uh, you know it's interesting so i have been listening to uh the jeff probst podcast on uh, fire the official mm-hmm. survivor podcast have you checked that out at all kellen no i have not okay so uh this the episode that came out today was all about challenges uh and did they had really completely i'm sorry did he just like completely effing ignore what's happening about they don't really talk about this yeah, of course they don't they really don't. talk about what's happening on survivor uh they t- they talk a lot about like the making of survivor mm-hmm. uh and mm-hmm. today's episode was really all about the uh the challenges and you know i think that you get like a little bit of a sense of like you know the that's been the most informative thing about the jeff pros podcast is that you do get a lot of like the why are these things happening and when they talk about like their team like it is like super impressive like what the resources that go into creating the survivor challenges and to the person with a hammer everything looks like a nail. You know what I mean? It's like, so they talk about how like, we've got like the the whole crew of people that's working to build this thing and build this. And what do they have end up doing as like the challenge department grows and grows, the challenges become more massive and bigger. (laughs) And you need like uh, that they, this is like a, feature of the show of we want to see feats of strength we want to see people pushing heavy things and people pushing themselves and try and and doing things they didn't think that they can do and so that the builds for the challenges have also become increasingly bigger and heavier and more massive now i can't speak to why they want to do this with three teams i i that has never been explained to me other than the idea of there's nowhere to hide uh but as you know the the show really really wants to feature these these uh incredible feats of engineering that they are producing and it is incredible i i don't want to take anything away from it so that yeah it's going to really have uh, this result where the people that are not able to contribute in these early challenges, which they are all of a specific uh, format of heavy, big, you know, like power. And when we don't have players that that is their skill set, they are really in a bad spot. Yes. And all of them are also set up fine. Even as a little thing as put the, a manta ray puzzle first and then have them run the physical part 
you can't even make up for the maybe that doesn't work out in the math but you can't even make up for getting that far behind physically if it get to the puzzle and you're already so far behind you can't make up for that no matter how good at puzzles you are mm -hmm. um and one of our challenges people were like writing the surfboard on ghost island and there was like a, a slide word puzzle with bradley and i like we were just so far behind there was we did that puzzle faster than they did but we were way too far behind mm -hmm. because of the physical part yeah anyway so it's just purely there is no like if they got rid of jam jam for example like carson carolyn sarah and helen would not have been able to lift the blocks that are like probably physically not able to do it so mm -hmm. that is part one of the system that is yeah setting young women up okay. for failure okay anything else uh, about no that i think that, that is missing? part one is established okay uh but there are more parts there are more parts i think the second part is that there is a societal <laughs> a societal view of women and there's a societal view of men and you can go back to when reading research around how boys in school are called bosses and girls in school are called bossy. Um, boys are allowed to be assertive while a woman who has a volume to her voice is aggressive. Um, there are all of these things that in our society of this unfortunately like gender binary society that people want us to stay in, there are these stereotypes of men versus women. Mm -hmm. In Survivor, if you are a woman who appears to have a plan, this comes from my husband as well. So it's not just a crazy lady on the mm -hmm. on the pedestal. Um, and I didn't ask him to do this, by the way. He just offered this today while we were talking about it. And he and he said, the moment you're seen as a mo as a woman with a plan is the moment you're the first one to be on the chopping block. Mm -hmm. And to think that you have to get through however many night 17 tribal councils and be the woman who has never had a plan and then somehow at the end convince everyone that you were the one with the plan who Marianne so successfully, beautifully did it. Marianne amazingly didn't seem like the woman with the plan and then stuck the landing. But that is impossibly hard to do. Yeah. To not be vocal about your game because you'll be seen as a threat. Helen saying, I don't want to be seen as an intelligent person. And then there she is on the puzzle. And it's like, just by being herself, mm -hmm. she becomes a threat that way. Even with Carson, who gets it? Yeah. Carson, the astronaut, he gets to be smart in a way that Helen doesn't, right? And it's is that funny to you. I know he's not really an astronaut. But... <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is funny. Yeah. I mean, Helen breathed and they're like, ah, watch out for her. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Like, how dare she exist in this mm -hmm. space? So I think we have to understand their challenges that are set up for certain people there are societal beliefs that are inherently inside of us that we have biases around women in control and then over all of it is a set of male executive producers mm -hmm. who can have a conversation about building these bigger and bigger and bigger sets to stretch out their egos without even commenting on the idea that it may impact someone different than them. And I think we have to see that whole yeah. and, system. And I don't problem. know the um, gender makeup of the, you know, producing team that's working on the challenges. So I, I don't want to uh, like, well, I know you don't have to say, it. I know Jeff and Matt, I'm pretty sure. I'm well, pretty yeah, sure that's, that, that's the, that is the top. And I don't know what they changed uh, post season 39. And I don't know, uh, you know, what they changed post uh, season 40 in terms of like the, the makeup of the producing team. I, I agree with everything you're saying. I just don't know necessarily That's like uh, the makeup of uh, the executive of, team. Of Jeff and Matt. That's what yeah. I'm speaking of. And I want to also one more thing and I can, I don't know that I'm, I'm solving. Well, I do have some suggestions on how yes. to improve it, but I would say one more thing is 
I, as a white woman, get to have this conversation, and that is just, I, I'm a woman, and therefore I have this that I get to say and be upset about, rightfully so. There are additional, uh, people call it intersectionality. If you want to learn about it, please research it. There are very many ways that people are put in a bucket and have expectations on them in society and survivor, LGBTQ+, plus, non-white people, any, any group of people that has been or felt othered. Mm -hmm. And there are additional hills to climb in this system of survivor, in this system of life. And I want to really honor space for that as well. Yeah that I am also in a place of privilege of being able to sit here and complain about this. So yeah. Well, there is you know, that. the irony of all this is that uh, if you say this on a podcast, you're a troublemaker. And if you say it's <laughs> tribal council, you know, uh, that's, that's a great episode. <laughs> sorry. Ramona quit. I'm sorry. We'll have to do that again. Ramona. Sorry. You're good. We're, we're, you're good. Ramona, come here. Be good. We're still working on having, she's six and she's, she's still learning ways anyway. Yeah. Um, well, you said you had some fixes <laughs> for uh, what Survivor could be doing differently. Uh, you said that um, obviously the challenges, that's an easier one to fix. Like what do you think can be changed about things that are more societal than things that are sort of just part of survivor. I think everyone taking the time more idols. To, give all the women yeah, more idols. Yeah, give all of the women idols. No, no, I don't believe that we should give women anything to to have an advantage just because they're women. I think, yes, making challenges that are um, like balancing on the water, using balance, uh, just things other than strength. Mm -hmm. Obviously there's tons of things. Watch Australian Survivor for some ideas. Um, but as far as the societal approach is understanding and doing the research into what historically has happened on Survivor. So you can look and see the reality and maybe not contribute to that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think if I were to ever play again, I would just point blank be like, I am not voting a woman out first. Mm -hmm. I mean, look where it got Maddie, but I think being the person to, to say, I, I won't do it. Um, maybe you end up getting sent home for that. I'm not sure, but I think doing research, understanding that there are biases that we aren't aware of, um, and looking into ourselves is really the only thing we can change. Mm -hmm. And um, I think Bryce and Wynn have put out a lot of content. I think there are other survivors who have put out a lot of content around what it's like to play Survivor um, for a lot of different people. And with the diversity campaign, it's wonderful that we're getting yeah. to see different people on the screen. And I think that will help. So more of that continuing yeah. to invest in the diversity campaign. Show. And they've done a great job with with the casting of the show. But, you know, I, it was my belief that the idea was with trying to do things like the diversity campaign was that you wanted to try to make the game equitable for all of the players who play in the game. And it feels like that this has been an oversight in the new era of Survivor, specifically here with uh, these very small tribes, these super intense challenges, no rations for the contestants, and also no swaps except for this one person swap that we saw last night. Yes, agreed. All okay. of those things sh should help uh, in theory. <laughs> yeah. All right, Kellen, let me uh, ask you about this tribe swap that we saw last night, okay? Uh, of course, uh, Ghost Island featured a number of tribe swaps. I believe mm -hmm. you all swapped. You started at two tribes. Then you swapped to... Uh, then you swapped to two, two tribes. Two tribes. Yep. And then you swapped from two tribes to three tribes, which yes. was very unique uh, that, that we have not seen. And then you went from three tribes back to one tribe, okay? Uh, yes. And... And so we saw this opportunity for these players to go to the Shipwheel Island. They got a new buff and they got an idol. I would love to get your thoughts on uh, the way that the show decided to do this. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. 
it is an interesting twist to see this idea of one person being sent over. I think it would be more interesting if, uh, if we're just going to send one person to have the tribes decide if anyone wants to go. Um, I think giving the winning reward a choice to pick was unique, but didn't tell us anything about anybody. Mm -hmm. So I think one way to make it better, if you want to do this, is to say, if anyone wants to switch, volunteer and go. Um, maybe no one would, which is okay, I think. Um, the second part is why waste viewership time on things like this trip to the island when literally we learn nothing. We learn absolutely mm -hmm. nothing new, not about the contestants, not about the current tribes, nothing new information, no new information was learned. So I just see it as an overall waste. Yeah. I and think Carson talked about how play. I think Carson talked about how he wasn't going to say anything to anybody else. Yes. So that is something <laughs> I, I think is great. And Carson is playing Survivor, I think, extremely well. Extremely okay. well. Um, I don't know what everyone else's temperature around Carson is, but the way he played out the island and talked about it and the yeah. way he went into his new tribe, I think, was like chef's kiss. Okay. Yeah, but let's circle back to how Carson is doing over at Ratu. And okay. I just wanted to ask that, okay, in terms of one person, you're sending one person over and you're giving them an idol. Uh, do you feel like uh, was that too much power to give to? Obviously, the show doesn't want to see somebody sort of like, okay, you got picked to go on the track, you're swap screwed and you're out. But was it too much to give them each an idol putting the total number of idols for the season count up to six idols at one point on Wednesday night. I can't even keep track of how many things there are. Like, thank God the people on Twitter who put out the list of this many, like Mike Blooms was very helpful. This many real idols, mm -hmm. this many fake, but thinking real idols, this many fake idols. Like it is a massive, first of all, I guess all the producers wanted was for someone to go to a new tribe and get forced to play an idol. Apparently that is the most exciting moment they're trying to create is an idol play because yes. everything, all paths lead to someone playing an idol last night. Um, do I think it's too much power to give that person? No, because the disadvantage is extremely heavy to get shoved somewhere new. And the only thing that keeps you on an even playing field for the shot that you just you know took um by getting yanked from all the play that you've been putting in mm -hmm. like the only thing to give them a quote-unquote fair shot is probably to give them an idol i think without the idol they're just left in the out in the dark so okay i hate all of it <laughs> <laughs> it's too much okay it's um, too much, but in, in any way did it remind you of back uh during your second swap uh, or sorry the first sorry the first swap of survivor ghost island michael yerger has mm -hmm. found uh an advantage okay uh that he is in the group that is uh in the minority of numbers mm -hmm. and that you all are in the majority having to figure out how to play this where michael yerger is uh, saying that he has James's idol from Survivor China, which can he can use to protect actually not one but two people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was one of the most shocking moments of my own game of Survivor. <laughs> was when we were going in, so I've gone to Ghost Island. I've saved my bow. We have original Navidi five for original Malolos, right? And in the middle of Tribal, Michael says. I have a pitch for all of you on Navidi. Mm -hmm. I don't remember if they showed it. Like, I forget how they showed it, but this is this is what I remember happening. Okay. Yes. Um, Your truth. That Michael says, I have James's idol. I have two, or it works for two people because he went home with two in his pocket. And I am just, but they announce, we are all voting for Bradley. You guys should come and vote with us. To yeah. show that you want to work with us, essentially, is what they were saying. Yes. Originally, when we had gone into that tribal, we were voting Michael. I know the story is that Brendan believes that he knew it was him, blah, 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 blah. We were voting Michael until Michael pulls out that he has an idol. Then 
I am going through the tribe. Bradley is just struck because Michael says along the lines of he is the Hitler. That's what he said. That got edited out of the golden boy. Trust me. I remember that. Michael was like, Bradley is the Hitler of their tribe. We are voting him out and you should come with us. Mm -hmm. So Bradley is shocked. We are all shocked. I am trying to keep these baby ducks together. Like I just saved my vote. I have to keep everyone together. And we go around, we tell everyone, everyone's like, remember plan B, plan B, plan B. Of course, Sebastian is in the background. He's like, I don't remember plan B. <laughs> Sebastian Bradley tells them it all, everyone sticks together and works. They made the mistake of saying who would they vote for. We didn't care that Bradley was going to go home if he were the sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Um Sorry, no, I just got lost. Were you like, come back to me? Come no, back this to is Earth. good. This is a good story. <laughs> okay, okay, good. Um, anyway, so what ends up happening is we thought where we made the mistake, we thought Michael was closer to the girls than he was with Brendan. We didn't think he would say Brendan if he had two idols, he would play it for himself and one of the girls. So we voted Brendan off that night. Mm -hmm. Um why did you ask me about this? <laughs> because that we had a situation <laughs> where, you know, after a swap, somebody has an idol. It's yes. a situation where you have to, uh, di as uh, Stephen Fishback uh, said when I said, uh, what's a profession that somebody needs a steady hand? Uh, disarm a bomb. That's kind of like what you all have to do. We did have to disarm the bomb right in the middle of that tribal. Absolutely. One of the most fun moments of being on the show. And I think my first tribal actually mm -hmm. so it was a it was a crazy thing to have that go down in the middle of tribal and good on michael yerger it was a great story right james went home with two idols now it can play for two people uh he did a great job but thankfully you know navidi strong you got to keep that tribe together keep the majority keep that tribe together. together and there was no carolyn on navidi uh that was uh you know chelsea wasn't like uh like oh i gotta work with uh you know i don't i don't like how i'm being told what to do Thankfully, no one was feeling like they were being bossed around too much. No matter what Malola was trying to say <laughs> was that Bradley was bossing us all around too much. Um, I, he was, but I liked it like that because he was the perfect, perfect boss yeah. to be on the chopping block. So, yeah, the swaps... Um, a survivor swap, I think, is fun to watch. Right. I think a survivor swap is fun to play. Um, I'm not sure why the... Do you know why the producers think that it's not the best way to go as far as a, a good show? It's unclear. You know, all we get really about this is what we get from the Jeff Probst uh, podcast. And they haven't really talked too much about, uh, you know, why exactly they haven't been in favor of uh, tribe swaps. I think that they've just been much more in favor of they really love this idea of going back to Ghost Island of you have to, you know, risk your vote to get a reward with the possibility of a penalty. And I think that that sort of just eats into this idea of a tribe swap. They really want to have these uh, small tribes, no place to hide, and then everybody coming together at the merge. And while I do like, you know, when we've gotten, you know, exciting play at the merge uh, from having the three tribe uh, season, I do think that, you know, mm -hmm. you sort of like, pay a tax up front with these uh, three tribe seasons, not just uh, as we've seen with voting the women out, but in terms of sometimes you don't get to know the players as well with three tribes. I do think you tend to have a more exciting and fluid post merge game, but for whatever reason um, it used to be, you know, they'd keep you on your toes and now it's like, Nope, this is the show. Yeah. I, well, I mean, even starting, starting with two tribes and going with three to three tribes, I thought that was really fun in ghost Island where probably you, the best way to do it. Yeah. It's really, it's really fun when you're out there. I think it creates our pre-merge was interesting to watch. I think um, more so than post-merge and you get the opportunity to really meet most people and by a day, whatever, I guess there weren't even enough days, right. To let them mm -hmm. do that many. Cause we, we swapped to three tribes on day 15, I think. Um, but that's a really fun way to do it. You've had a chance to meet a lot of people because you swap once, once you get to those three tribes that are smaller and you have nowhere to hide, you've absolutely had the opportunity to build relationships that should carry you through. Um, and to learn enough about the other tribe in your first swap that you can apply that to your game and know where people lie and that sort of thing. So it's, 
the trinkets just don't make sense to me. Um, mm -hmm. And the people make Survivor, they always have. So, um, yeah. Let's talk a little bit about Carson and uh, how you feel like that he has done such a great job here as he uh, switches over to Ratu. What is it about Carson that you really like so far? So I think I mentioned, alluded to it earlier, his relationship with everyone on his initial tribe seemed to be strong. Um, I think he appeared to have good relationships with all of Tika um, and did that in a way that wasn't people calling him out as too smart or too strategic. Um, I think on this, to talk about this episode specifically, when he's landed at Rock 2 Beach and the way that he sits back mm -hmm. and tells the story of what's going on at his tribe in a way, it's not just like, oh yeah, Jam Jam's in charge and I don't know nothing. His complete demeanor comes across as I'm a little nervous to be here. Um, not, uh, I, I really want to fit in. I mean, he's really drawing people in with his almost facade of naivete around mm -hmm. the game. Um, and I thought it was a beautiful way to bring, I mean, to have Matt being like, I want to give him all of the knowledge that I have to get someone like Matt to come to you, to pour information to you means you landed on that beach in the perfect way. I, I know what's going on, but I'm a little bit on the outs. Someone else was in control and I'm really looking for friends. I think that's the winning combination. If you do get stuck in a weird tribe swap and you're in the minority. Kellen, I want to float something uh, past you that came up earlier today. I do a uh, call uh, with the patrons called the Patron Happy Hour. People call in and they ask me questions. And one of the patrons called in and asked a question. Uh, his name is James. James asked me, if you are in this position, you get swapped with the idol. Why not just go? Should Carson show up on Ratu and say, hey, I'm here. I have an idol. I'm going to play it at the tribal council. So um, who wants to work with me? I, I did have that thought while I was watching the show. Like what if they just walk up with the full truth mm -hmm. um, to like, automatically get people to open up their, you can't take it with you. It's like, I, I can only use it before the merge. So uh, like, Hey, hopefully we don't have to go to the tribal council. Hopefully we don't have to use it, but just like a, uh, like, let's use me, uh, you know? I think to everyone probably gets you through temporarily, but maybe doesn't build any additional bonds. I don't, um, I think choosing who you tell at the right time is still more powerful than just letting everyone uh, know your Okay, business. good. One on, uh, even better, even better. In one-on-one -on -one conversation, Matthew, I have something to tell you also. I have, I have the hidden immunity idol. I didn't want to tell everybody, but... Uh, I can only use it before the merge. Oh, that's so good to know. All right. And it's like, okay, well, now they're not going to be, you know, you're getting, they're going to use you in the vote. In fact, I would actually only do that and start speaking of it if I heard my name was coming up, which ultimately you do, right? You ultimately usually get a tingling or an inkling or a fear, in which case then you tell people, then you start to plant the seed, deflect that your name has come up. Mm -hmm. um, it would be really hard to say you could read that necessarily, but I think you right. don't want to even use it on a one-on-one -on -one conversation building unless for some reason you think you need it. Carson, right now, Matt is coming in and telling him everything. I don't think Carson should be spilling those beans yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I guess the downside of that, we're thinking about this as like normal survivor and like, oh, what if somebody has knowledge is power, Kellen? You could tell somebody, oh, I have the idol. I'm going to be using it tonight. And now you go to tribal council. Be like, uh, Kellen, do you have the idol? <laughs> Can I have that back, Can please? I have that idol? It's like, <laughs> oh, why did I say anything? <laughs> why did I tell? Mm -hmm. Oh, God. Is there going to be a knowledge is power on top of Jeff all Jeff loves knowledge is power. He said on the Jeff Probst podcast that they said, if you could get any survivor tattoo, uh, what would it be? He said, I would get uh, KIP on my butt. He loves it. <laughs> they love knowledge is power. Hey, oh, knowledge is power, but not when you talk about it all the time. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Like actual knowledge of where everything is, is power. Um, there shouldn't be a thing that like get, tells you where all the things are. Isn't it just like more and more like Jeff's like ultimate wish of knowing that he would win the game if he were to play and like all of the ways that he relates to the game, which is he knows everything. And so therefore, he oh, feels I never powerful. thought of it that way because he's the omniscient character and therefore he wants players to be more like him in some way, shape or form. So that's, that is an interesting theory. And I, I'm, I'm, but that's not how I look at it. That I just feel like that. Unfortunately, we look at the game as players. And I think that a lot of people that listen to podcasts that they look at the game as, as players. And how would I do if I was a player in the game? And I think that the people that make the show, they don't have that same viewpoint. They look at the show as how do we how do we make this as exciting as possible? How do we not have like one dull minute in the show? Like, well, we can't just like bank on the players being interesting the whole time. We need to we we're producers. We need to be kind of like uh, putting as many ideas as possible in this thing because that that'll really make it as exciting as possible. And so I think that they look at it not like we look at it of how do you improve Survivor the game? And I think that they're just only looking at Survivor as a TV show that needs to be more and more exciting to compete with celebrities in costumes, singing pop songs <laughs> with lights and uh, going off. Yeah. And um, that's, I think, what they're, you know, that that's what I, what I think that they think is going to bring the ratings and, you know, keep their jobs for as long as possible. And like, we are not casual survivor fans in any way, shape or form. Um, so maybe that's true, but I, I would say, I think of my parents who are casual survivor fans and like yes. the true demographic of like, who's watching survivor. And they're just simply confused. Like they are mm -hmm. confused. By, I mean, I'm confused and I keep track and listen to podcasts and, and keep up with Twitter every week. And, and you like, played on the show. I played on the show. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's that part of it. And yeah. I, I have trouble keeping track of everything. And so yeah. maybe they should start to think about bigger, but mm -hmm. less. Um, yeah. Maybe that's it. But I, I think it's like one of those, uh, I, and I don't want to get the artist wrong, but is it like uh, like a MC Escher drawing where it's like the the more you look at it, the less it makes sense. If you look at it from far away, it's like, oh, okay, this happened. Oh, yes. But I don't think it's a good sign for the show when you have like Survivor know it -alls. And Steven and I are like, oh, what? The? We don't like uh, we can't explain what just happened. As a survivor, no, no, it all. Not mm -hmm. at all. <laughs> yeah, it's it's just. I think it's a blanket, no question about it, too far. It's gone too far. And if you, if I were to go play Survivor now, I would think of it more of a game show. Yeah. <laughs> because if I think if you go into it thinking, how do I go in, make relationships, and come out being the person who gets voted to have a million dollars, I think you will crash and burn, you know, Mm -hmm. All but one person is going to crash and burn. And then to think that you could have done anything differently, you have to live with that anyway. And I really want modern era survivors to understand that they're playing Candyland. They're not playing poker anymore. And it's like, you yeah. just pull the card and you might, or shoots and ladders rather, I think is a better example. You're playing shoots and ladders and not poker. And so knowing that you're going in and you can just flip any card and it could send you one way or the other um, to be able to survive your way through it from a humanity standpoint, I think you have to look at it that way. And even as a fan to keep myself on board, enjoy the people who are on TV because casting I think has ramped up in what, who they're bringing on the show in so many ways. Mm -hmm. I love the cast of last, almost everyone in the cast of last season and everyone on this season. Yeah. Casting is, is nailing it. So. And I always try to, you know, especially when, uh, you know, we're critical of like creative decisions that are being made. I feel like that the casting is as good or if not better than it ever has been in the history of the show. And I do think that that is by design of that. They're going to find like really amazing, interesting people. And then 
they're gonna like let whatever like happens happens like uh like let's just like take in very interesting likable people and then let's set this to random and you know ultimately whoever we're left with will be happy just let it go. i mean they, they're giving even the moments they let us have like watch and never watch the challenges again on a rewatch i watched them again last or this mm -hmm. morning when i was prepping for this because <laughs> just watching danny like flip into the like head first over into the net before the slingshot and then jam jam was like slowly rowing into it and then poor sarah steps in like we're all like why are they rolling into that net and then sarah's plans like not that i want to see people do look silly but even just watching their personalities flip over that net is what is amazing about watching survivor in in my opinion so letting them go out and do that what would Matt and Franny do and Josh? How would Josh have played this out with Danny and Heidi? That would have been amazing to watch. Uh, so letting the cast be, you're a thousand percent right. Um, I don't, I can't imagine there's many people who think differently except those that are in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in the same way, like the Survivor players, like go and just enjoy the experience and see what happens. I think that might be like how the show is like being made also. It's like YOLO. Like, let's see. Well, like we got these people here. Let's just enjoy it. <laughs> just see what happens. Whatever happens, happens. Yeah. Yeah. Callan, I have some questions for you from the listeners of the podcast. And we have a lot of good ones for you today. Okay. Um, Let's see. Uh, if Luca wants to know how many advantages from season 44 will end up on Ghost Island. <laughs> Boy, Ghost Island is probably like overpopulated to hell, right? It already was. There were already, it was a full on when you were at Ghost Island, like up the path, bigger than you can imagine from screen. Um, there were already plenty. Ghost Island was already a full cemetery and now it is, it is sold out. The, mm -hmm. All of the stalls are sold out in the museum. Mm -hmm. There <laughs> will will Sarah's fake idol she got from Carolyn be <laughs> headed to Ghost Island? <laughs> oh, probably, probably. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, lots of stuff coming to uh, Ghost Island. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, how about a question from um, this is from Dodge one two three four five six seven. Would you leave a fake hidden immunity idol uh, for someone on your own tribe to find, especially if they're your number one? Kellen, how would you potentially use a fake hidden immunity idol, and or, or would you not even bother? Honestly, I'm not sure I would even bother unless I unless you were down to it. Like all of this uh, yeah. sparkle stuff is like pretty crazy to think about even with what Carolyn did this episode to kind of go this to play hard this early when it doesn't get recognized by the jury necessarily it seems hard however if I were in say the top 10 and um maybe I would have loved to plant one for someone who I knew was going home so they would feel safe and play it mm -hmm. um I found it really interesting to watch actually the birdcage debacle of mm -hmm. what to people this is the one advantage that i've liked because you get to see how the team interacts with each other around it it actually gives you more screen time um so that has been fascinating to me i like the idea of putting the fake idol back in the cage and seeing somebody else find the key and mm -hmm. watch them do that um I think Carolyn made a miss there of not knowing who picked up her right. idol. I have to say, if I were going to plant a fake one, I would be more like Danny, less like Carolyn, that you want to know who ends up mm -hmm. with it um, because it's not great to just throw it out there and then not know where it goes. Yeah. I think the birdcage has been pretty good. I don't love that they gave them fake idols with the birdcage. I feel like that the birdcage, uh, mm -hmm. just get an idol in the birdcage. Who has it? I think is that's enough excitement for me from the birdcage, but to have the fake idol there also. When I went back and did a deep dive into the fake idols, really, my biggest takeaway was like the best thing that a fake idol can do, Kellen, is make people think you yourself have a real one when you don't imagine you know at the final eight uh final, final seven ghost island if you if you yourself had an idol that was fake that people thought might have thought was real yeah 
that would have been extremely helpful. So yes, I do like that, Rob. Using your extra fake idol to why are you giving it away to people? Extra in your pocket seems like a really good thing to have in your wallet. And now it's gone. <laughs> to where? To whom? To where? <laughs> to, to go? It's, it's off to Ghost Island. I didn't even let Sarah keep it. <laughs> I know. So, oh, you know, yeah. you get, they gave you something and it's like, all right, well, uh, let me find a way to, to, I got this fake idol burning a hole in my pocket. Let me just, I mean, uh, it seems like a mistake. It does seem like a mistake. I think you're right. Keeping it as your own is the, is the best way to control the narrative. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. This is a question from Wade who wants to know, do you think that Jeff is hoping for an advantage get in scenario where the inheritance advantage is also played ever since last night. I keep imagining a tribal where somebody leaves holding three to six idols, <laughs> which is possible, right? Like we're mm -hmm. getting, we're getting yeah. to the point where, and the inheritance is the one. See, here we are. I don't, Freaking Sarah enough. got it's voted the, out with it. It's off okay, to Ghost so Island. Gone. But if she would have played it, then she would get whatever advantages are played. Could you imagine Carolyn's confessional where she's holding like six idols in her, like my babies? <laughs> Just handing, having people line up and pitch yeah. for why they should Taking get them, that. throwing them over her shoulder <laughs> like the leaves. Yeah. <laughs> with one sock on. Mm -hmm. that's one of my favorite moments of the season um i thought when you said throwing one over her shoulder i pictured like a newlywed bride tossing mm -hmm. tossing yeah like a bouquet, the bouquet over who wants an idol yeah <laughs> i guess the question is does jeff want this apparently jeff does want this otherwise he wouldn't have... oh yeah there he is you check in mm -hmm. to see if he was nodding yes yeah i just over your <laughs> is this what you want jeff apparently it is otherwise they wouldn't put this many idols out into the world because there are still five real working idols in the game at this point is that where we're at there are five working idols and now three fake idols in the game oh my god i mean what do you think people should do who play next season about about what about <laughs> finding an idol i mean i just think that like hey you, if you got them play them just immediately. Like, stop saving them. If you don't think you need it, you just have to play it on someone else. Do you think that's what Jeff is ultimately getting, is wanting to happen? Is that there is some idol played every episode? I do think that that is what production wants. I think mm -hmm. they their worst fear, I think, is sort of just like a ho-hum tribal council. Um, you know, I, I think that, like, their, mm -hmm. one of their worst fears is like, okay, like, uh, in Ghost Island, okay, um, Stephanie goes home on it and it's, there's nothing she can do about it. And it's just a straight up vote. Nobody has any advantages and that's the episode. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they're like, well, let's never let that happen again. People liked that episode. If I remember correctly, <laughs> well, not the right people. <laughs> <laughs> I guess advantage get in. It's, it's funny. What I thought when the question was read is does Jeff want an advantage yes. get in to happen? He, and it's they, like, it's it, already it, happening. He, lo he loves advantage get in. He no. talked about that recently on the Jeff Probst podcast that they say, they said that that was their vision at the start of the season of ghost Island was the scene in Reservoir Dogs where everybody is pulling a gun on each other and that came to fruition at Advantage Get In. It was one of the great, it was a great moment. I'm speechless. In I'm fairness, Sari herself said it was a, uh, a great moment, which uh, <laughs> well, I will, with all due respect to Sari, I disagree. Uh, but, you know, that's they loved it. Oh, 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 man. It's just, it's hard. It's hard. It's hard. Kellen, You're out of control of it. The the ultimate thing that Survivor is worried about is that things could get boring. Just because they themselves are bored does not necessarily mean that Survivor is boring. <laughs> no. I could watch Carolyn, and I think most of America could watch Carolyn yeah. for 42 you minutes You already a have week. Carolyn on a TV show. It's not going to get boring. You have Jam Jam on a TV show. Mm -hmm. You have... I, I mean, watching Danny, we haven't even talked about 
that's what all this advantages and idols and all this BS has done is like, there are so many people talking about Matt. Oh my God. Yeah. How I thought for sure he was going to miss pulling that key down when he jumps just because things are not going right. his way. Yeah. I mean, Franny is amazing. There are so many talking about Danny's game so far is what we should be talking about. Yeah. He is hilarious. And there's just no time to right. do that because of all this stuff. Helen, boring is underrated. You know what else used to be boring? <laughs> Politics. Okay. <laughs> I miss those things. Exciting isn't always good. Exciting is not always good. And yes, exciting and controversial versus <laughs> um, all the feelings that we used to get when you used to watch Survivor. Yeah. Okay. All right. How about a question? Uh, Tommy Guam said, Kellen famously decided not to play the Ghost Island game. How does she feel about production taking away choices? And how would that have affected her game on Ghost Island if she was forced to play now this season it's been a departure over at Shipwheel island you used to have the option of do i risk my vote or do i protect my vote and if you protected your vote you ultimately opted out of potentially uh losing your vote and but you couldn't get an advantage now you stick your hand in the bag at least as it happened uh the one time you stick your hand in the bag you do not have the option that has been taken off the table, the option to protect your vote. The only way to protect your vote is not to go to Shipwheel Island. I think it's a mess on what is interesting about watching Survivor. So, um, and okay, if they had done Shipwheel Island and all three people had chosen to not risk their vote ever once, then okay, maybe I would understand changing the format. Like, oh, no one's out there risking their vote. So it's not interesting because everyone just holds on to their vote. So we have to force something new, but that's not true, right? Every time before on risk your vote or not risk your vote, somebody risked it every single time. So I don't really understand why the production has decided that people don't even get the option. I think watching to see if people feel comfortable enough, if they are a risky player, if they are not, is what's interesting about an idea like ship Shipwheel Island. If I had been forced to, um, I think the question was if I had been forced to play the game and risk my vote and had lost my vote, um, I would have to think through really hard what I would have done, probably pulled in Jenna and Stephanie and worked with the girls to create a new majority. But um, it certainly would have forced my hand to play a different game than what I played. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, how about from, let's see, uh, from Noah says in Ghost Island, um, oh, you know, that's some, very similar to uh, what Tommy had asked. Okay. How about... Um, Ryan Peterson, Ryan Patterson wants to know, uh, do you think that the new modern era would benefit from going back to two tribes, i.e. Navidi versus Malola? What are some of like the other underrated aspects of two tribes versus three tribes? Um, let me think through the underrated. I think you mentioned I think we that missed you... out. We never saw Navidi go to a tribal council as the original Navidi. Correct. We didn't. Because as if I recall, that would have been um, potentially a 5-5 five, five split. Potentially. Yes, I think mm -hmm. so. Um, we were robbed. <laughs> we were robbed of a 5-5 five, five split. Um, I think the underrated parts of two tribes are what you said earlier already, which is you don't get to, um, you get to see more of the who's working with whom because you there's only two splits. Um, what else is good about it? I mean, sorry, I'm drawing a blank. Yeah. Even though, well, I just I guess love I know the reason. Two tribes, uh, just because I feel like that the players have so many options. It's really the opposite of that. There's nowhere to hide. There's so many different variables of like what could happen. Whereas, you know, it really gets down to such a binary choice of like, okay, it's either this person or this person tonight. Yeah, there are different ways to go, different ways to move in the next vote as well. I think um, once you see where the lines are drawn with more people, then you have more pawns to play with if you're a person who is running running the game or running your own game. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, just more time in general with each tribe because there aren't three different camps to go to. So we get to know the players a little better. Um, even, even if 
their fear is that just two tribes is boring. Like they're not going to stay two tribes like we did. And we were two tribes before mm-hmm. our first swap for like nine days. Now there isn't even room for that, right? So even if they were just two tribes, it would only be for the first two votes or something. That would be for six days. It's moving so fast that keeping two tribes and putting in a swap, um, like couldn't get boring. Mm-hmm. Okay. How about, um, this is a question from, uh, Tommy Guam wants to talk about tribe loyalty. Is tribe loyalty still important or is it a thing of the past mm-hmm. in the new era? What do you think about that? I think that the game moves pretty darn quickly to use tribe loyalty for too long, given it's not a ton of days that you're with that original tribe. Plus tribe loyalty, once you merge, doesn't ever likely give you a strong majority. Mm -hmm. Um, So to me, tribe loyalty is a great fugazi fugazi for I'm in the numbers and I'm in the majority of the majority. And therefore we should just say that we're all a happy family. And that's the way to move forward with the narrative of keeping your power. I think here in the new age, even if they would go to two tribes, the game is moving so fast that the bonds that you would perceive like, or be perceived to build cannot be as strong as strong simply because of time total time. Kellen, I agree that the people that they cast on the show, they don't need to put as many things into the game because the players are so, uh, even from ghost Island, you know, that from you, from you, from the ghost Island cast, not to disparage the ghost Island cast to now that the level of like game knowledge of the players is probably, you know, twofold at least. Uh, Yes. A different chart. We're talking, Mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. So I think the players are going to make moves. Like you don't have to worry about like, oh, this group has six and they have five. That's it. Game over. I, I, that's not even what was happening in Ghost Island, even though they chose to Mm -hmm. say that, right? Like that it wasn't even what was actually happening. So um, I think anytime that it seems like people are talking about tribe loyalty, when you're a player and when you're watching the show, while you may be annoyed by it, maybe just look one little, just dust the dust off the top of that tribe loyalty sign and see what those players are actually talking about. Okay. We saw Sarah voted out with her idol or her fake idol last night. She didn't find out it was a fake idol until uh, a little while after they filmed the show. You and Dr. Mike were tweeting about this uh, today, about uh, finding out that sort of like a a little bit from the opposite way, that Chris Noble had an idol in his pocket when he got voted out that nobody knew about. Yes. One of, I have to say, as much as I don't want to give Chris Noble credit for anything happy in my life, uh, that was the absolute best moment for me watching the show back was Chris told And to this day, I I think no one that he left with an idol that day. So, Mm -hmm. and that he had gone off into the boat to go get the idol. I think no one knew. So I'm like sitting with, I think there were 75 people at the bar. It was like the one viewing show. Viewing parties weren't as popular back then. And I had one week of it. And this is where it was. I was sitting at the bar with like the big screen. And he like starts to go out in the middle of camp. And I'm like what is happening mouth hanging open and to find out that he had an idol and didn't play it that whole time. I mean, it was insane. It was probably my favorite moment as a survivor and survivor fan to lived out there and been a part of it and had no idea what was going on. I'm so thankful that he didn't tell anybody. Was Chris difficult to live with? I feel like that you uh, did not really have a lot of interaction with him on camera. He was very difficult to live with. Yes. Extremely. Yes. Extremely. Yes. 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 Like, uh, and he and I just didn't, did not have anything in common about the way we view the world, about how we talk about things and people, um, <laughs> about reality, you know, <laughs> um, <laughs> we, you mean like survivor and big brother? Uh, yeah, well, it's <laughs> yeah, just nothing in common whatsoever i Mm -hmm. wish him all the best but no we were not friends um in fact in like when we would run into each other at post-show events where we would all be together it was no really love lost there okay 
All right. Kellen, I want to ask you about Australian Survivor, but I want to make I want to give people the opportunity. If you, do you, was there anything else about Survivor 44 that you want to make sure we address? Let me check my notes real quick. I talked about Carson. Oh, Jamie also did a pretty good job of coming, uh, uh, like landing on the beach. Go back and watch. Yes. If you're a person who's about to play Survivor, watch what Carson did, watch what Jamie did. And then in contrast, watch what Josh did. The complete opposite of what mm -hmm. you should do. Yeah, Jamie's in, been very but, fun. Yeah, Jamie's, Jamie's a great watch. I think, yeah. And um, that's it. Yeah, that's all good. Okay. Oh, good. We crossed everything. I'm excited to see what happens next week. I really hope Tika doesn't go back to tribal just because I think it is a clear. Um, well, it's not clear, but mm -hmm. I don't. I don't want it to go down to to two there. So, but mm -hmm. is that what's going to happen? There's one more vote, and then there will be like the fake. If merge. I had to guess, yeah, mergatory. Yes, okay. that that is what I would uh, suspect of how that's going to go. But you know, it's uh, that's one of the problems with such a strong cast is you don't want to see anybody go home. But uh, ultimately, um, you know, people will be more mad if somebody doesn't go home than if somebody does. <laughs> probably, probably me too. I guess. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so, Kellen, I was, uh, you know, going through your uh, socials earlier today, and I saw that uh, I didn't know you were so big into Australian Survivor. Oh, well, Australian been... Survivor season 2023 spoiler alert. OK, <laughs> don't say like, oh, you spoiled Australian Survivor for me. I like I, I like I am done. We're done talking about Survivor 44. <laughs> Yeah. No, if you don't up. want to know something about phone. Australian Survivor, or is it like, oh, I was sleeping and then I woke up and I didn't hear the spoiler alert. It is hard to not get spoiled, however. on I have to say, oh, you have to be a master of like remembering believe not me. to even turn over. Don't your turn on your no. computer. <laughs> yeah. Do not turn on your computer. Use an old school alarm clock because if you pick up your phone at all, mm -hmm. it's over. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, um, watching this season of, of Survivor Australia has been in a new way. I won't even say that it reminds me of being a fan before yes. because it's not. It's in a new way of being obsessed yes. with now, Survivor. I want to ask you, have you watched previous seasons of Australian Survivor? I've watched one previous season of Which Australian one? Survivor. I think season two. Okay. That's maybe the best one. I, 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 well, I was going to, I'm pretty sure it's season two. It has. Don't say, don't say who wins. Uh, well, but I don't know uh, who, who, Yes. Okay. Um, uh, but what got you in, so into this one? Did you see a lot of the hype? I saw, I saw the hype. Yes. I think yes. that's what it was. And actually good old Adrian here. He is making a, a, an appearance again. My husband, he said, wow, don't your, didn't you say your poker friends have that Australian survivor link? Can't, should we start watching it? So I have to actually give him the ultimate props so for getting me. Your it. husband was not a survivor fan. You turned him into one. And now he says to you, hey, Let's shouldn't we be Survivor watching AU. Australian Survivor? That yes. is exactly what happened. Yes. yes. And it is so, it has been so good, but it's also like such a contrast to the things that uh, we maybe are not loving so much in the new era. Yeah, I think it does make you feel some sort of way about watching U.S. Survivor, which is mm -hmm. not necessarily a good feeling of having to go back to watching U.S. Survivor because Australian Survivor is what you wish Survivor would be like to watch. Right. And I will say that this season has been an all-timer and from all accounts, the previous season was not. Okay. okay. So uh, they're not all like this. I think that when Australian Survivor, when it's good, it's incredible. And when it's bad, it goes on forever and ever and has a lot of things that people don't love. Is that because the cast of the cast? Would yes. you say when you said last season it wasn't so good or did yes. production change a lot? No, well, I, I'm, I'm not sure. Again, I, I have less visibility into Australian Survivor production than I do into American Survivor production. But I do think that at its worst, that I think that Australian Survivor can turn very, very bro heavy. You mm -hmm. know, there is a lot of 
mateship, a footy, you know, a lot of former uh, rugby players, active rugby players. And so a lot of times that can be a very sort of like, you know, hey, guys stick together, yeah. big, strong athletes stick together. And sometimes that can take hold and become the dominant alliance in a season. And again, season's 50 days, 26 episodes. Yeah. Like sometimes that could be a bit much. So if that's not your thing, then those seasons might be borderline unwatchable. Yeah, well, that probably, I, I should be careful when I say that I love Australian Survivor. I should say I love this season of Australian Survivor. Some folks are going to um, be like, wait, oh, that, that sounds amazing. Let me check that out. <laughs> Probably not the people who are still listening to me talk, Rob. Yeah. <laughs> um, the that though is the case to what we can pitch that the survivor gods are listening is that to take a group of players and let them be when it is a diverse cast and a cast that you've put the legwork in to mm -hmm. get great human beings out there on the island and you let them be, it can make great television. Yeah, yeah. So it's been uh, very, very fun. I, I saw that you are, is, is it fair to say your favorite player in Australian Survivor is Simon? <laughs> um, I don't know that. Oh my God, Simon. Like, what I'll say about this, is he my favorite player? I would actually say Liz is probably my favorite player on the season. Um, just because she's ruthless and like, is she? Stanable. Being... Uh, what? Stanable. Oh, totally stanable. First of all, she's so hot. Like we, well, we okay, both well. can admit that. Uh, so hot. Maybe they know, okay. That. Okay, yeah. Liz is so, I think I can say that. I hope she doesn't feel mm -hmm. um, belittled by that. Like, I first of all, she's so hot. Third of all, she's so hot. First of all, she's very smart. She reads the room. She's doing a great job. Of course, there's this entire huge George narrative, and she's not getting a whole lot of um, maybe spotlight on the way she's playing, but I think she's playing a, a great game. However, Especially of late. I've really liked what she's been doing. Oh, my gosh. Like, just being like... And then she started speaking Russian to herself of like, come on, you've got to do this. Like, don't screw this up. It was just mm -hmm. a great moment. However, Simon is a survivor player who has made me feel i think every core feeling on like the human uh ring of emotions to have like he's made me feel like he's an he's a silly bro like that i don't like he's made me feel i've cried for simon i have laughed at simon i have laughed with simon i mm -hmm. felt sad for him i felt lonely with him like he has been taking us all, I believe, on the journey, a 360 degree emotional journey of watching his game and to like really just like a bro kind of at the beginning and then towards the end being like, and he's like, and I want a car. And, and I'm like, oh my God, and you want a car. Like it feels yeah. so good to, I bought my snuff tat. It has not arrived yet. Um, I, I paid full price. I am just a, a little Stan fan, Simon, Simon little fan over here. Um, I, I'm hoping that he uh, someday will know who I am. That is my yes. goal, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, well, that's, it's been really, really fun. And I've, you know, there's been so many like US survivor players that I've been like talking to about Australian survivor. And of course, Shannon Gus does the amazing coverage of everything survivor global. And I've been doing like a weekly check in with her, which has been very fun. We talked with Evie uh, this past week about uh, this season. And so th those have been really really fun to do but yeah i just have like a whole group of like u.s survivor players that we talk to because to me i really feel like that and adam klein said this on the podcast with shannon this past week that the australian survivor season i think is a much truer representation at least to me of what playing survivor was like especially compared to what the U.S. Survivor game is at this point in time, which, especially from what I played, is like unrecognizable uh, to somebody to say that, you know, it's like showing somebody like, uh, you know, an NFL game from the 40s and then showing them like what's on TV now. Yeah, it has a nostalgic feel, certainly, when you're watching it. Um, my, my biggest question on this Survivor AU journey. And I would say as equally as um, amazed as all the ways I feel about Simon, I feel 
very confused about how I feel about watching George. Okay, why? Um, Tell me about your feelings about George. So watching George as a, as a master survivor player brings me to this, what I think is a U.S. survivor question of, are you playing to win survivor? Or are you playing to get screen time? Yes. And I think that he's ultimately playing for screen time. And I think it will be like Tony stands out as this, we call it a, uh, what, what kind of word do you call the Tony win? Just uh, I call it a an unicorn. outlier. Yeah. I'm sorry. What did you say? Unicorn. A unicorn. Like if George wins this, I think it's a, a unicorn way of winning. I don't think it can be repeated again. Mm-hmm. Um, and back to where we talked about the system of survivor I don't think a woman could go out and speak about people the way about and to people, the way that George speaks about and to people and be seen as a master game player. I think that would be called a C-U-N-T. And so <laughs> very, that very is, fair points. Very fair point. <laughs> that is my mm-hmm. confusion because sometimes I am watching him and just being like, I cannot believe he's doing this and getting away with it. Um, and if he makes it all the way to the end, like good on him, I, I wouldn't take nothing away from his game. It makes me just to be frank, jealous that I mm-hmm. would never be able to go out and play survivor. Like he plays. Survivor. Maybe one day we will get that. Mm-hmm. Survivor 75. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Survivor 75. Yeah. I don't know. It's, it's really. I'm trying to think watch. of who would be the, a, a the woman player who has been the closest to that and has been successful. Um, I feel like that maybe Sophie might be the person, but Sophie was not is not nearly like uh maybe like uh in private as like cutting as George. Um not nearly uh in, in public, although she did say that coach was like uh the dumbass girl that russell hance had in his alliance uh she did say that at the final tribal council so um i'm but i don't think that she was like as she was like also like um under the radar and uh not seen as the person who was uh the mastermind at least not in her original winning season maybe a little bit more so in winners at war and then she ultimately had to be taken out by tony mm-hmm. but i don't think that we've ever had uh a woman come close to winning the game that uh played it at all in the style of a george and again yeah, there's don't... been very few men who have been <laughs> a george fair. Also. fair very fair i guess and, i don't and, remember and succeeded yeah i don't remember sophie going up to people and doing things like saying your head is on the chopping block. You are going home. Your game is dead. And this is what you're going to do. I don't remember Sophie ever talking no, like that. No, okay, but I'm just, I, I was like, looking for who I, maybe the people in the chat uh, or in the. Uh, I uh, think people could... tried to say Kim Spradlin, which is absolutely no, not true. No, definitely not. <laughs> no yeah. way. Um, and, and But going back to what you said earlier about like, uh, you know, a, a woman with a plan ends up being a target. You know, Kim came out of a season where it was men versus women. And, you know, if, if Kim started on a season with, you know, it being, you know, uh, you know, you know, five men and five women in her tribe. Like maybe somebody's like, Hey, uh, this Kim, she's got uh, too many. Pl-. I mean, she probably would have figured out a way out of it, but there might've been some talk about like, Hey, we have to get, take her out. Yeah. I think she, we, a lot of people, and I agree with this is Morgan from our season was very like Kim Spradlin esque, And it's like, yeah, she was gone as soon as there was a, a early chance. So anyway, mm-hmm. I, I cannot recommend if you have any hesitation about watching survivor AU, it is worth it. Uh, mm-hmm. And we'll see what happens, right? Finale weekend. Finale next right week. Up here. Okay. All right. Kellen, uh, well, this was so great to get to catch up that this was, uh, again, these podcasts with you are always so fun. Uh, I would love to do more stuff like this uh, in the future. You know, I think one of the favorite things, and I'm not sure we we had time to talk about it all that much, um, is I have a whole sheet of all everyone that's on the tribes and all of the ways I I have described who they are and what I want to root for them for. And 
where they've been in life. And because of all this advantage getting and all this stuff, we don't really get to spend as much time talking about these people who have been through a whole life of living. Like nobody has been who is on that beach has just been like going through school and just being like average in life, like in boring life. Like mm-hmm. all these people have wonderful stories and yes. you get to see such a tiny snippet of it on, on TV. Uh, I wish we had more time to talk about some, yeah. like more about the contestants. For sure. And then the bar to get on the show is so high. I think about it like, uh, you know, my college that I went to, uh, SUNY Oswego uh, uh, or Oswego State University, as they call it now, uh, that I feel like at the time that I got in, since, like uh, in the years after, like, I don't think I would have gotten into uh, the college. I think they raised their standards. And I think the same thing was true with Survivor <laughs> also uh, in the many years that came to pass. But Kellen, do you think that, you know, they've shortened the game from... 26 uh, from 20 39 days to 26 days and also they've sort of like accelerated the pace you know how do you feel like that that affects the players who go through this experiment do you think that it will be more impactful uh, in terms of like how it changes people's lives because it's such a tornado or do you feel like that the people that went through the 39 day experience might end up having more of a change to their lives because of going through this experience or we, we still don't know. I think we still, we still don't know. I would say that the survivor experience is so much bigger than just 26 or 39 days from the moment you send in your casting video through, uh, when your show is done airing on TV that I'm not sure just shortening those few days changes the outcome of someone like, is my life more impacted from survivor than say um, the seventh place person of last season? I'm not sure just because of those seven to eight days. I don't know. What I do know is that going through the survivor experience when you're already on a path to a pretty exciting life, a lot of pain, a lot of happiness, a lot of different things. Going through the survivor machine uh, is a huge impact on everyone's life. I can't imagine that even because survivor has a huge impact on people's life who've only been out there for three days. So um, Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that that changes that. However, it would be interesting to know if to, to know. Yeah. um, But I guess we'll have to wait and see as uh, the years go by, of course, the Kellen B. This is the third Twitter <laughs> handle you've had in the time that I've known you. I'm at officially, I shall say, never to be changed again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're in officially. The at the Kellen B. Officially on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. You can find me at the Kellen B. Um, yes be with one E. So I'm trying to, trying to make it easy. I was just on a podcast the other day. It was a mess to try to explain what I was on all three different handles. So I finally found one that works because somebody took Kellen Bechtel. I waited mm-hmm. too long. <laughs> okay. Um, but you could follow Kellen, of course, uh, Instagram, Twitter, um, LinkedIn also. Oh yeah. I'm on LinkedIn, Kellen mm-hmm. Bechtel and KellenBechtel.com. I have a new website yeah. coming out. Hopefully by the end of this month. So what about coaching? What about coaching? Are the, are you accepting I people am looking for coaching? Clients. Yes, I am taking new clients. Um, calendly.com backslash Calibectal. You can just mm-hmm. put time right on my calendar. I would say that coaching is, and life coaching, like it makes me want to ro- roll my eyeballs in the back of my head. Eliza style, like the idea of it is really annoying to me, even though that is what I'm doing with my life. Um, but what I would say is people who find it valuable to spend time with me or maybe people who are feeling stuck, feeling overwhelmed. A lot of my clients are people who say their cup has been just poured out and poured out and poured out, whether they've been putting too much into their corporate job or um, they're wanting to change into an entrepreneurial entrepreneurial lifestyle like you, Rob, and like me, where we get to work mm-hmm. for ourselves. Um, so helping people kind of get out of the daily grind and get into a life that's more full of adventure and joy and happiness, because we do not have to live the life that we think we should live. 
like I said, back on those days on Ghost Island. And uh, I'm on the other side of that. And I've been helping others get there as well. And it's so fun and so fulfilling. And I care about my clients so deeply. So if you feel called to reach out, please do. I'd love to hear from you. Okay. Empathy is Kellen's superpower. She's still got it. I still got it. I still got it. still got it. Kellen, thank you so much for making the time to talk about Survivor. I really thought we had a very interesting conversation about everything that we are liking and not liking here in the new era. And I do think that we're, this is a, such an interesting question this week about what happened uh, at Tika and if it was the right decision for it's all really parties. A lot. There's no right answer, right? But luckily we get to see one of the options play out. And uh, revisionist history, then we'll get to say whether or not Carolyn made the right decision. <laughs> for sure. All right. Thank you all so much for joining us here for this podcast. We'll continue all of our coverage uh, with the rest of our Survivor podcast uh, into the weekend. You can uh, check them all out in our Survivor podcast feed when you subscribe to Rob's website.com slash Survivor feed. Jenny Autumn will be my guest on the feedback show. So if you have any questions that you did not hear on this podcast, you can send them in as a voicemail. Rob has a website.com slash voicemail or send us in a question. Rob has a website.com slash Survivor question. Thank you so much for joining us. Take care, everybody. Have a good one. Bye.